trillions of microbes surround us at all times. They drift through the air, coat every surface, live within us, and thrive in all corners of the world. It's one of the reasons Earth teems with life, unlike anywhere else we know in the universe. Most of these microbes are completely harmless. Some even help us, but others can compete with us and the mushrooms we grow. For many new growers, the journey starts with excitement. You prep your space, inoculate your substrate, and wait for signs of life. But then something changes. A strange green fuzz spreads across your monotub, a sour smell starts coming from your grain bag, or maybe nothing happens at all. No growth, good or bad. These are all classic signs of contamination. Contamination is common in mushroom cultivation because, unfortunately, the same nutrients that nourish your mushrooms also attract a host of competing microorganisms. Contamination includes anything that negatively impacts your grow, like bacteria, molds, pests, and even viruses. In this video, I'm going to go over the fundamentals of mushroom contamination, including what causes contamination, how to avoid it, and how to identify it in the first place. It's very often that we may think we have mold when it's actually mycelium. The biggest telltale of contamination, specifically as it pertains to molds, is rate of growth. Mold grows really fast, whereas mycelium likes to take its time, you know, stretch its hypo threads. For example, if you're making grain spawn, it generally takes up to two to four weeks to become fully colonized. Mold growth can spread over the surface of a substrate in just a few days. And of course, it loves to show its colors. The most common molds in mushroom cultivation are bright green, orange, and red. You may also run into cobweb mold, which does look a little bit more like mycelium, but there are many ways to differentiate it from mycelium, which we'll get into shortly. Healthy mycelium typically appears as a white, cottony, or rope-like network colonizing the substrate. While generally white, its appearance can vary depending on the species, which is why it's important to have a solid understanding of what you're growing, and how it might look different during different stages of its life cycle. Occasionally, a yellowish liquid known as exudate may appear on the mycelium. This is usually a sign of healthy metabolic activity, though in some cases it can indicate that the mycelium is actively fighting off a contaminant. Keep an eye on it, but don't get too concerned if there aren't any clear signs of contamination. Now let's dive into the kinds of contamination you may encounter and how to identify it, starting with molds, which are also fungi, just not the kind of fungi we want to be cultivating. And if you think you might have mold in your monotub, spawn, grain, grow bag, or any other part of your setup, isolate it from your grow space immediately until you know for sure. Personally, I'm a firm believer in tossing anything that shows clear signs of contamination. But mushroom cultivation can be expensive, and throwing out a monotub is not always an easy choice. That said, molds are not to be taken lightly. If left for too long, they can spread and contaminate your other grows, and sadly I say that from experience. In some cases, it might be possible to salvage part of a grow, depending on the type of mold and how aggressive it is. For example, it's fairly common to see mold form on the surface of a block or cake during a second or third fruiting. If the mold patch is small, some people have found short-term success carefully scooping it out with a sterile tool, but this is near the end of a grow. If you're at the beginning of your grow, the real problem is that mold will consume all of your nutrients in your substrate before your mycelium has the chance to take hold. Kind of like weeds in your garden. And just like weeds in your garden, contamination is just as common. Many people ask us, why is contamination an issue for mushrooms grown indoors, but not for mushrooms grown in the wild? Outdoors, you're not in control. Environmental factors like sunlight, wind, rainfall, and temperature all play a role in how mycelium develops and when mushrooms fruit. On top of that, nature is full of microbial life. In soil, rotting logs, or leaf litter, countless microorganisms interact in complex ways that even science doesn't fully understand yet. This is why certain popular wild edible species like black trumpets, chanterelles, and porcini can't be cultivated yet. They're mycorrhizal, meaning they rely on symbiotic relationships with other plants and microbes in their environment to grow properly. 
Even for the more commonly cultivated species, the abundance of different microbes outdoors actually helps protect them against a single competitor mold or bacteria taking over entirely. All that competition keeps things in check. All of these biotic and abiotic factors shape what kinds of fungal species take root, how they grow, and when they grow, and it can be incredibly nuanced. Indoors, it's a different story. You have far more control over what you're growing and when. This makes indoor cultivation more predictable and allows you to grow mushrooms year-round rather than relying on seasonality and maybe a good rainfall or two. But that control comes with trade-offs. You're working with nutritious, sterile materials, which are highly susceptible to contamination. In addition, the nutrients you're working with are finite. A 25-pound monotub has limited nutritional resources, and if a mold or a bacteria take hold, they can quickly outcompete your mushroom mycelium, and there isn't a whole lot you can do once that happens. In other words, when you eliminate all competition for your mushroom, you also remove natural checks on contamination. Any stray spore that lands on your grow has an open invitation to take over, whereas outdoors it would face immediate competition and environmental stress. That's why even a tiny lapse in sterile technique can result in a sad, moldy monotub. Regardless, I think it's better to be safe than sorry when dealing with contam, and I would recommend tossing it if you can. That said, if you guys have any interesting ways you deal with contam, I would love to hear it, so please let us know in the comments. Now, let's dive into molds. Trichoderma, commonly known as green mold, is one of the most aggressive contaminants in mushroom cultivation. It often begins as a white, fluffy patch, making it difficult to spot early on. Eventually, it turns a striking emerald green as it enters its reproductive stage. Despite being a major headache for growers, Trichoderma is a fascinating fungus in its own right. It's highly adaptable and ubiquitous in soils around the world, thriving in nearly every environment. This is also probably why it's so prevalent in mushroom cultivation. Next, we have orange bread mold. If you have orange bread mold, you'll know it. This mold is super fast growing and is one of the most pervasive. It starts as a tiny orange white wisp, but within hours, it'll explode into a bright orange powdery spore patch. If allowed to grow, these patches produce round, lumpy formations. In my opinion, it is almost impossible to salvage a grow if you have orange bread molds, and if you try to, it will only make things worse. Sadly, say your goodbyes now and get it as far away as possible from your grow space. There are some cases where you'll want to double check that the mold you're dealing with is not just mycelium. There are certain species of mushrooms, such as pink oyster, chicken of the woods, and cordyceps that naturally produce mycelium with subtle pink, yellow, or orange hues. Cobweb mold is another common contaminant, but it can be a bit trickier to identify. It appears as a light grayish-white growth that seems to float just above the surface of your substrate. It's often mistaken for early-stage mycelium, but the key difference is in its texture. Cobweb mold grows in thin, wispy three-dimensional tufts rather than in dense strands. This mold often shows up late in the incubation phase, right before fruiting. This mold can be very tricky for beginners to identify, as it does look a lot like mycelium. And to be honest, if you think you have cobweb mold, in many cases, it's just mycelium. The last mold I want to cover is black bread mold. If you've ever left food sitting in the fridge too long, you've seen this mold. It typically starts as a white fuzz, then shifts to gray, and eventually turns black, developing tiny black dots, which are its spore structures. This mold spreads easily and is often carried by fruit flies or fungus gnats. Beyond mold, there are bacterial contaminations that can affect growth, specifically when working with grain. Bacteria is fairly easy to detect because it will make your grow smell like rotting fish. One of the most common bacterial contaminations in mushroom cultivation is bacillus, 
also known as wet spot or sour rot. It lives on and within grain and typically shows up as a dull gray or slimy patch in uncolonized areas near the bottom of grain jars or bags. If that contaminated grain is used to inoculate other substrates, bacillus can spread there as well. The most obvious warning sign is the sour, rotten smell. And that's pretty much all you need to confirm that you have bacterial contam. Because bacillus spores are highly heat resistant, they can survive pressure sterilization if the grain hasn't been properly prepared. That's why it's the cultivator's responsibility to soak grain for 12 to 24 hours before sterilization. Soaking allows dormant bacillus spores to germinate, making them vulnerable to heat during sterilization. Skipping this step is one of the most common mistakes that leads to contamination, especially if you're making your own grain spawn. Lastly, let's talk about how to avoid contamination in the first place. Pinpointing the exact source can be difficult since there are so many variables at play. One of my go-to resources on this subject is Paul Stamets' book, Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms. In it, he outlines six primary vectors for contamination. The cultivator, the air, the media, the tools, the inoculum, and the growing environment. If you're just growing mushrooms from a kit or pre-colonized block, these factors matter a lot less. The mycelium has already consumed the substrate, making it much more resistant to contamination. But if you're starting from scratch, it's important to follow proper sterile technique. The cultivator. We are often the number one contamination risk. Our hands, clothes, hair, and breath carried a myriad of spores and bacteria that can infect or grow. Before handling cultures or opening substrates, always wash hands thoroughly, wear clean clothing or a lab coat, and consider gloves and a face mask. Avoid talking or breathing directly over sterilized material. Even droplets from your mouth can introduce contaminants. The air. Fungal spores are everywhere in the air. Using a laminar flow hood, knockbox, or HEPA filter helps reduce, and in some cases eliminate, airborne spores. Never underestimate how easily spores can drift. Even opening a door or moving too quickly can disturb settled spores. Keep your incubation and fruiting rooms clean and well sealed to limit airborne contaminants. The substrate. The substrate itself can harbor contaminants if not treated properly. Grain, wood chips, manure, and other materials often come with native microbes. Proper pasteurization or sterilization is crucial. Always follow proven sterilization protocols for best results. Tools and equipment. Anything that touches your culture, spoons, knives, jars, spore syringes, and anything else can introduce contaminants. Flame sterilize metal tools or wipe surfaces with alcohol. If you're working in a still air box, never combine alcohol and flame sterilization. When not in use, keep tools inside a clean box or glove bag to minimize exposure. Even larger equipment like incubators and humidifiers should be regularly cleaned and sanitized since they can easily become breeding grounds for mold spores. The inoculum. Spores, spawn, or liquid cultures you introduce can carry contamination. As I mentioned earlier, spore syringes and spore prints are rarely 100% sterile. They may contain a mix of different fungi or bacteria. So be wary. If you're not working from spores, liquid cultures and grain spawn should come from reputable sources like us at Norspore. Insects and pests. Flies, gnats, mites, and even rodents can bring in contaminants from the outside. For instance, fruit flies and fungus gnats are notorious carriers of blackbread mold. The spores can cling to their bodies as they move from substrate to substrate. Make sure to use fine mesh screens on vents, sticky traps, and keep your grow room as insect-free as possible. And lastly, the growing environment. This includes factors like humidity, airflow, and sanitation of the grow space itself. High humidity and stagnant air can encourage molds such as cobweb. Ensure good ventilation and avoid using waterlogged substrates. Keep your growing area tidy. Never wear outside shoes in the grow room. Sweep up old substrate scraps and disinfect surfaces regularly. A clean, well-ventilated environment is the last line of defense against any contaminants that slip through. Again, all of these tips are precautionary. We'll get comments from people who say that they don't practice sterile techniques at all and get great results. While that is possible, you don't want to run the risk of ruining your investment. 
It can take a lot of time and money to grow mushrooms, and it's just better to stack the odds in your favor by practicing good technique from the start. Even small improvements in cleanliness can mean the difference between a healthy flush and a complete and utter loss. If you found this guide helpful, please give it a like and subscribe for more mushroom cultivation tips. Drop a comment below sharing your own contamination horror story or tips. Happy growing!